What I am 100% confident of, Alexi, is that fiat money will continue to debase, okay? That's the mathematics of fiat. Because of the debt spiral and the fact that the interest burden is growing faster than the economy, that interest or debt burden is going to continue to expand and the spiral increases. So they have to print money and that printing money causes the debasement of the currency. They have to do quantitative easing forever okay. because of the debt spiral. So they can pretend they're not going to do it. And I'm like, fuck you guys. Okay. It's this simple. It's math. You cannot not do it. If you want to try, the world will implode. If you want the world to implode, try to do it. Welcome to the Microscopic Podcast presented by Gold Republic. My name is Alexei Jordanov. And on this format, I invite you to look at the world through different lenses to see what's hidden in plain sight. We'll dive deep to understand the forces that drive macroeconomics, financial markets, and the nature of money with alternative assets like gold, silver, and cryptocurrencies. We'll also investigate how geopolitics and power games shape the world we live in, but also what we can learn from history to understand the present and prepare for the future. Today, we have the privilege of introducing to you an extraordinary guest whose expertise and insight have garnered him accolades and recognition throughout the Bitcoin community, the thought-provoking mind of Greg Foss. With almost 40 years of experience in fixed income markets and a wealth of knowledge in credit analysis, Greg has carved a unique path in the world of finance, becoming a renowned expert in bond markets, Bitcoin, and macroeconomics. Greg possesses a genuine desire to educate and empower individuals to navigate the often daunting world of finance. In this episode, we talk about the vulnerabilities of the current monetary system, how debts could spiral out of control and start a domino effect of collapsing economies, including the European Union, to default on the debt, and why sound money like Bitcoin and gold are the only insurance to such kind of events. Hope you get fresh insights and enjoy this conversation. If you do, please like and subscribe and leave your reactions down in the comment section below. And most important of all, share it to those who need to hear this. I like to always start with um, the personal background and a bit of your journey. So, because it's also the first time we talk, and just also like for the audience to get some context about you, I like to always ask uh, the first question, which is, what is or what was your childhood dream? Oh, okay, great start. My childhood dream. <laughs> I was a Canadian, uh, so I grew up in Montreal, Quebec, and uh, I would have to say that my childhood dream was to play professional hockey for the Montreal Canadiens, okay? So I'm not sure if you follow hockey much, but uh, the Montreal Canadiens are a very historic uh, hockey club. They've won 25 Stanley Cups, which is the equivalent of winning, you know, uh, the prestigious European League uh, trophy 25 times in soccer, or sorry, in football, European sub football. But the point is, I guess my childhood dream was to be a uh, professional, uh, uh, professional athlete. I... Um, I didn't come very close, but uh, I pursued my love of sports when I was growing up. So uh, uh, I could I could expand on that if you wanted to. What eventually led me to Bitcoin, believe it or not. So really, well, that would be like a great uh, next follow up question. Uh, what led you first to the to, yeah to the financial system just in general, from like sports to finance to finance, and then uh, the orange pill, I would say, um, epiphany of Bitcoin. <laughs> Sure. I love your, your question. So, um, so I, I, I grew up in Montreal. There's a, a very good university in Montreal called McGill university. Um, it's, uh, uh, world renowned for its sciences, medic, medical, uh, school, med school and sciences. And, uh, I was recruited to go to McGill, uh, to play sports. And I, uh, I was good enough to get into the engineering school. And after about two weeks of engineering, I realized, oh my God, I don't want to do this for my entire life, but I, I like mathematics. Uh, I'm at the school really to play sports. And so my focus was on sports, but I was in engineering. And wouldn't you know, four years went by in the blink of an eye and I became an engineer. But I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to be an engineer. Like, I just know I don't want to practice engineering. 
I, I want to get into business. So the logical thing for me to do was to apply to a, uh, a business school for a master's of business administration. And I was lucky enough to be accepted down in uh, an Ivy League school, which is a, a prestigious institution in the USA, Cornell University, which is in upstate New York. And so the roundabout way that I said it led me to Bitcoin is because all of my analysis always relies upon mathematics. So when I graduated from Cornell in 1988, I could have worked on Wall Street, but I decided to come back to Canada and work in uh, the finance business in Canada. And I joke that I became a financial engineer. Okay. My history in financial markets is in restructuring and distressed debt. Okay. So it's in junk bonds, distressed debt, debt versus equity arbitrage, mathematics, probability statistics. But yeah, I guess I got my, my sports led me to engineering. Engineering led me to mathematics. Mathematics led me to financial engineering. Financial engineering led me to understand the Fiat Ponzi. And then I said, I better understand how to protect myself against the Fiat Ponzi. And so I found Bitcoin. And when precisely, I mean, that's, I guess it's a really long rabbit hole, right? Because um, it's a whole process. And as understood, you spent 30 years, three decades in that industry. Not many can, can claim that, I think. And you've seen things. And um, when you look back, what were the um, things that really put you at discomfort where you went, uh, you went to bed and you thought like, what the hell is this? Like really sleepless nights? Great questions. Okay, so the first one was when I came out of business school in 1988 and I was working for Canada's largest financial institution. That's the Royal Bank of Canada. So it's a globally large uh, bank that would be, this, you know, comparable to ING, let's say, you know, in terms of its world uh, uh, presence. And Royal Bank of Canada in 1988 was dealing with problems that every single money center bank in the world was dealing with called Latin American debt. OK, uh, Latin American debt. Um, money center banks had lent petrodollar revenues to uh, third world countries, lesser developed countries, and they were uh, denominated in U.S. dollars. And as this U.S. dollar debt uh, interest expense payable in U.S. dollars, the U.S. dollar strengthened and the currencies weakened, the lesser developed country currencies weakened to the point where they couldn't make their interest payments. So there were 45 countries that defaulted. These were countries primarily in South America. Everyone knows the big ones, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, but it also included the Philippines, Vietnam. So, you know, lesser developed countries all around the world. There were 45 of them. Royal Bank of Canada had a huge exposure and so did other money center banks, including the, the European banks. And Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady in 1988 came out with a plan for Mexico, just for one country, to solve the Mexican debt pr crisis. And I was assigned a project. I worked directly for the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer of the Royal Bank. I was assigned a project to analyze the Brady bond package. And I said to myself, OK, I'm going to analyze the Brady bond options that the, that the Treasury Secretary is presenting to Royal Bank, as well as all the other banks around the world to restructure the debt. But I said, I better look at the whole portfolio first. And lo and behold, very quick analysis here. It doesn't sound like a lot of money in today's dollars, but it was, it was at the time. Royal Bank of Canada had $4 billion of lesser developed country debt, $4 billion, of which $1 billion was to Mexico. And the Brady plan was for Mexico. But I'm looking at the $4 billion portfolio and the average trading price of the debt was 25 cents on the dollar. It was defaulted debt, which meant if the portfolio was marked to market, meaning you had to take a 75 cent write down on the value of your loans, you would have to write down $3 billion, right? It's pretty simple. It's, it's accounting. And I went to the book value of equity of Royal Bank of Canada and it was less than $3 billion. And I'm like, wait a minute. If we were to write down the Latin American debt to the market price, 
Royal Bank of Canada, Canada's largest financial institution, is insolvent. I mean, holy shit. This is 1988. I just spent six years in school. I go to the CFO. His name's Emil. Emil Bodzuk. Great guy. Don't dox him too bad. I hope he's still alive. But at the end of the day, I say, Emil, we have a big problem. And he says, I know. Don't tell anybody. I'm like, what? Don't tell anybody. This is Canada's largest financial institution and it's insolvent. And I'm absolutely certain the same thing was with Citibank. The same thing was with with ING. The same thing was with Barclays. All of these banks were in the same situation. Hence, Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady's Brady plan for one of the countries. So I just went home and I'm like, this fiat thing, this is ridiculous. This is a bank that is over levered it has not enough equity or risk absorbing capital to write down the value of the loans and it has to be bailed out well this was the first of four financial crises i've been involved in in the last 30 years started with latin american debt then was long-term capital management if your listeners haven't read the book when genius failed i recommend you you read the book when genius failed then the big one the great financial crisis in 2008 2009 i was working at a hedge fund very interesting uh uh opportunities and saw the world unraveling and then the fourth one was covid which has led to the crisis that we are currently in we are currently in a financial crisis people don't realize it yet but the debt spiral of the united states is expanding so quickly because of all the response to covid and these prior financial crises that it is unsustainable the fiat system will eventually implode it's only mathematics Okay, that's what I always say. It's only mathematics. So we are at a point where we need to protect ourselves against inevitable fiat debasing money printing to keep the debt spiral uh, going. There's no other way to keep the debt spiral going without printing more money. So therefore, you need to own hard assets. What are those hard assets? Well, I own gold. I own silver. I own real estate. But the one that I love the most for the asymmetry, the best upside for the risk that you're taking is Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. that's where we are. Yeah. Um, and I totally, that's how I went into the financial system was um, Bitcoin. I was just triggered about blockchain and then what Bitcoin was. It's, uh, it's uh, well, um, yeah, application killer, I would say, for what we call the, the world of cryptocurrencies, a blockchain. But we'll go into that uh, in a bit. Um, what's actually, first, I would like to take a step back and a bit look at the broader uh, scheme of things. We've just, you just mentioned the fiat system. And I would like to know from you if you see the fiat system as something that is inherently, um, uh, when we look at, of course, at the evolution of money, but in the current capitalistic system in which we are, is it something that is just, um, uh, driven by bad behaviors or, or mechanics? Is it something that is about capitalism itself or is it about just the way or the nature of the evolution of money we've led to this point with the, also the growth and the progress we've achieved through it? A little bit of everything, okay? So I can't put my finger on, on the one, on one part, but here, here's what I know. The banking system itself in the capitalist economy is over levered. Now, it's over levered 25 times its equity base, which is to say for every hundred dollars of loans that a bank makes, they only own four or hold four dollars of equity capital against a loan loss and the other 96 cents on the dollar is depositors money and depositors put their money in the banks because they are comfortable that the banks are too big to fail the government will always come along and bail out the banks but banking doesn't work any other way unless it is that levered because lending money at us at a skinny interest uh, rate over your cost of funds is not particularly attractive unless you can lever it and lever those returns and increase the return on equity because of your return on asset formula.
formula. There's a pot formula. I don't want to get too granular with you guys. The point is the system is built on debt. The banking system is built on over leveraged and continuously these financial crises kick the responsibility of that debt up to the government to the point where the governments now own all of the responsibilities of the debt of the over levered financial system. So you look at those crises I mentioned, Latin American debt, long term capital management, great financial crisis and COVID. Where did all the debt get kicked to the highest level, the government sovereign debt right now? Now, the problem is there's nowhere else to kick you can't kick it any higher. The government is the highest level of the financial institu- or, or the financial system, and they now are over levered. They have too much debt versus their tax base or their gross domestic product. So that is the problem with the fiat system. Yeah. So so if there's no other level beyond space and um, yeah beyond any like real realistic um, place or. Um, yeah, just the way we look at it uh, structurally, it's basically the end of the nation states. If they cannot sustain the debt that they are servicing, then they cease at existing in and of themselves, meaning that the trust that the citizens put into the government ceases as well, and it opens up a Pandora box of all kinds of possibilities, among which uh, civil war, um, war in general, um, tensions, social tensions that we already see coming. Uh, that's a, a bit uh, a grim. So. Um, yeah, what, what we could call a reset and uh, what uh, Villa Middlecope, that you also know, uh, a friend of ours in common, I guess, um, also propones into his book, uh, the, the Big Reset. Um, but so what does it uh, say about Bitcoin as a viable option? Because uh, right now we've uh, pointed out a few problems of the way the system is basically rigged and uh, what doesn't function properly. But what gives us the confidence that... Um, Bitcoin in and of itself, and now we, I'm just talking about Bitcoin, no other cryptocurrencies, no other DeFi or anything else, in yeah. and of itself is a solution to everything. I can't. I can't tell you that I'm 100% confident, okay, that Bitcoin is the solution. What I am 100% confident of, Alexei, is that fiat money will continue to debase okay that's the mathematics of fiat because of the debt spiral and the fact that the interest burden is growing faster than the economy that interest or debt burden is going to continue to expand and the spiral increases so they have to print money and that printing money causes the debasement of the currency and I got to be careful. It's not actually printing money. It's called lending. It's increasing the velocity of money through the lending, the, the commercial banks. The commercial banks are the mechanism that this all happens. And um, uh, I'm going to shout out to um, Saifedean Amus. I just finished reading his book, The Fiat Standard. The Bitcoin Standard is an amazing book. The Fiat Standard is equally good. And it tells you about the history of fiat and how it existed, how it started with uh, um, uh, the, uh, in the First World War, Britain went on the fiat standard. The Second World War, the United States went on the fiat standard because of the, the, the burdens of fu- funding a war. And then in 1971, uh, uh, the USA went off the gold standard onto a full-fledged fiat standard, which was the result of World War II. The point is, yes, wars, fiat, they play into each other. It's a horrible scenario. Scenario. But what makes me comfortable is that we need a solution. And I mentioned the other hard assets that I own. So let's look at Bitcoin as itself. And I'm sure your listeners already know why I think Bitcoin is better than gold, uh, but doesn't mean I don't not own gold. OK, I still own gold. I'm not trying to take Bitcoin away from gold where I do want to take Bitcoin. My Bitcoin allocation from is bonds. OK, I think bonds are the stupidest investment. And don't forget, I spent 30 years trading bonds. OK, they're ridiculous risk return assets right now. And if you're going to allocate a portfolio that has bonds, equities, gold, silver, and Bitcoin, take your exposure to Bitcoin 
out of your bond bucket, okay? Because bonds are a silly investment right now. You can try and trade them, but I wouldn't even recommend you doing that. You're picking up nickels in front of a steamroller because of this sovereign debt spiral. So what I would say is this, Bitcoin is one of my solutions. I think it is the fastest horse in the race. And you don't need to be 100% exposed to Bitcoin. You just have to own more than zero, okay? Owning zero Bitcoin is irresponsible because of its properties that will protect the system if the system truly unravels, okay? Transferability, portability, auditability, all the things that gold does not have, divisibility. Bitcoin is better at it than gold, but gold is still a $10 trillion market cap. Gold, uh, Bitcoin, half a billion, sorry, half a trillion. So under $500 billion. So all I'm saying is I'm not certain Bitcoin is the solution. The only thing I'm certain of is fiat debasement that you need to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is one of the tools. It's the one I like the most. You don't have to be 100% in Bitcoin, just don't own zero. That also leads uh, a bit to uh, another uh, question is about the debt cycle. I, I know that you've also talked about this uh, in also past interviews, but um, how, does, um, how does it fit with the long-term debt cycle? I know that you also know Ray Dalio. You've also uh, tried to, or inspired, or looked at a lot of his trades back then and uh, when you were working for hedge funds and uh, uh, portfolio management. Um, how do you see it right now unfolding? Only 100% certainty in financial management is fiat debasement. And you need to understand that that's driven by the debt spiral, which is impossible because of the four to one. And hopefully you got that on recording. The four to one total debt to, to, to global GDP. It's impossible for global GDP to catch up to the uh, to the interest uh, uh, obligations. OK, that's only math. Don't fight it. I agree with Ray Dalio in terms of measuring the debt cycles, though. You can default or otherwise reset it, if you will, monetize it or use yield curve control or financial repression, whatever you want to call it. That might reset it, but you don't want to be a bondholder in that event. You need to hold the hard assets that will protect you. And that's, you know, I mentioned them before, gold, silver, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. The best thing about Bitcoin, transferability, portability, auditability, divisibility, all the things that those other hard assets don't have, liquidity. Um, so yeah, the, the message is pretty clear. Don't hold bonds and just convert them into Bitcoin. Uh, so it's, Here, it's here's, I guess what I would say is, you know, if you're holding them, like I've, I've been pound the table, sell your bonds for the last three years. That's been a great trade. Okay. Negative yielding bonds were the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Well, very little negative yielding bonds left in the world, but even now bonds are not a great investment in my opinion, and you can try and trade them. But again, I, hopefully this didn't get cut out, but but if it did, I'll say it again. You're picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. Don't pick up nickels in front of a steamroller by trying to trade bonds. My best advice. Having done it for 35 years, you generally lose more than you win. That's all I can say. <laughs> I love that expression. It's very visual. Uh, but it makes me think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, pension funds uh, might be in trouble for those kind of mandates, right? Because they're required, right? To, to have a well, certain amount. Well, they're not required. They have what's called investment policy guidelines, and those things take a long time to change. But um, the... The, the, the typical portfolio, 60-40, right? Like 60% equities, 40% bonds. Bonds, when they were yielding, when I started trading bonds in 1988, you know that the U.S. Treasury yield was double digits, right? 14%. Wow. 14% for a U.S. 10-year. And that, that was, you know, in 1984. And it went from 14% and it went all the way down to under 1%. Okay, that's okay, but it's when it goes from 1% back up to 4%, which it did, that's where the pain comes. And it goes higher because of things like inflation, but also it will go higher when people worry about the credit quality, the credit risk of a sovereign borrower. So there's inflation risk and there's sovereign credit risk. 
I spent my life in credit risk. And the day that people start looking at countries as borrowers that can default on their obligations, those are the days when Bitcoin is really going to get a bid because they'll understand they need Bitcoin as their insurance on default of sovereign credits. Yeah, it's it's a the way I would resume it is just uh, an insurance against the system as a whole, Correct. right? Had a boy, yeah. It's uh, and right now there's a bridge uh, come like that we are building, and uh, as many people as possible try to cross the bridge. Um, and those who will not be able will be left uh, in in the legacy system. Uh, when we look at the European, um, yeah, sovereign debt. Um, yes, Germany is kind of the front. Uh, locomotive, uh, the bit, the yeah, sugar daddy correct. or sugar mammy when Merkel sugar was daddy, still, uh, sugar daddy, sugar uh, daddy, yeah. chancellor, as you as you said in previous <laughs> interviews. When when you when you look at, uh, for example, Target Two, uh, which is the the, the different the different spreads of sovereign debt, uh, dif- yeah, between among right. uh, European uh, um, countries of the yes. European Union, um, the eurozone, you basically have an ever expanding. Um, gap as well, which in the end, obviously, like, I mean, you're in Canada, so I'm not sure how much you're kind of following what's happening I do, in Europe. I do follow it, yeah. Why is it important, like, from a global perspective? What does this Euro experiment say about... Um, I love your questions. They're very smart. So look, I sort of hit on it before. It's called contagion. It's like it's if if the USA defaulted, sorry, if Canada defaulted, the USA will be the last country in the world standing. And then the Eurozone will probably be the second or third last China and Japan. It's a race to see who is the last man standing, but everyone else is gone. Okay. Now what's holding the European Union together is Germany. You already mentioned that. If it wasn't for Germany, we already likely would know that Greece and uh, the southern uh, the southern countries would be in deep trouble. They were in 2012. And then Mario Draghi came out and said with his bazooka, we will do whatever it takes to keep the uh, to keep the uh, Euro- Eurozone functioning. But that can't continue. It's the sugar daddy is finally going to give up the ghost and say, I can't do this. I can't support everything because it's going to cause my own economy to implode. This is the first time in history that Japan, that Germany has become an importer, a net importer. They used to be an exporter. When they're an exporter, it's good to keep the value of the of their currency lower, and that's why joining the European Union versus the Deutsche Mark, De- Deutsche Mark was advantageous because it brought the value of the Deutsche Mark essentially down and allowed them to continue to be an export economy. They're not exporting anymore. They actually are importing because of energy costs. Guess what? They actually want a stronger currency, not a weaker one right now. So the incentive for them to remain in the Eurozone is, I'm not saying they're leaving, but the incentive isn't as strong as it was. So if the largest economy in the world, which is uh, the United States, and the second largest Eurozone economy in the world, which is the European Union, if there's problems in the European Union, That's going to impact the United States. It's called contagion. So contagion between Germany, Italy, Greece, Spain, all of these things, yes. But contagion between the Eurozone and the United States, yes. Eurozone and Canada, a little bit. But Canada and the United States, when the Eurozone, it flows. It's it's like dominoes falling Mm -hmm. over. So it's all about contagion. It's all about risk that is, you know... In the great financial crisis, when I was trading, I owned protection, default protection on Lehman Brothers, but I owned it and I had bought it from Bear Stearns. And I'm like, yeah, I have insurance. Uh Uh-oh, my insurance provider might go bankrupt. So then I had to go out and buy insurance on Bear Stearns because I was insuring insurance on Lehman Brothers from Bear Stearns. This is the same thing that works in financial markets for sovereigns as well if one country goes down they have outstanding obligations to other countries that they fall back on and it makes that country more squeezed or whatever and all of these things work in financial markets it's called contagion so don't overthink things you can you're never isolated particularly in a global economy and yes very good question i think the eurozone implodes i don't want it to happen tomorrow but eventually 
my probabilities say that the euro eurozone will implode because it can't continue there'll be civil unrest with the in the various countries because they just don't like the way that either one person is paying for another person or someone's getting an advantage that they don't you know they're not getting the same it's just difficult to manage I, how many people how many countries in the euro in the union 30 something or whatever it's just like 27 it's a it's a dog's breakfast. Okay. Yeah. It's a dog's breakfast. I mean, if there were three of them, maybe it would work, but when there's that many, I just can't possibly see that the, you know, it doesn't fray at the edges. Again, I don't want it to happen, but you need protection against it happening. And if it happened, the currencies of those, of those countries that left would plummet. You need Bitcoin. That's your insurance policy against your own domestic currency falling off a cliff. Mm. Yeah, we've also seen a, a great sell-off of bonds, kind of the biggest, I think, in, oh, uh, yeah. in European bonds history, uh, which is, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe like a first worrying sign of where we're heading at. And Most of those were, though, it wasn't credit risk. Most of it was inflation risk. You remember I said there's two components, mm -hmm. there's credit risk and inflation risk. It will start to become a credit concern, Alexi, but not now. It was always just about inflation right inflation. now. Okay. The, only, the only time it turned into a credit concern was the um uh, in the united kingdom okay so just now with the guilders the correct the guilds yeah that was more credit concern than uh than inflation concern okay um let's uh, move on to like the more geopolitical part of things so we have a lot of things um, um happening shifting uh, i think we're witnessing not only a financial paradigm shift but just in general, like um, yeah, redistribution of global power and obviously China and Russia joining sides more and more solidifying uh, their partnerships. And just recently, China and uh, Saudi Arabia um, making deals about oil and denominating, denominating them in yuan and kind, kind of, yeah, um, showing a middle finger to, uh, to the petrodollar. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that kind of is already um yeah next step of what we call the de-dollarization of um of yeah world trade or just the erosion of the dollar as a world uh, reserve currency is that you think gonna accelerate what are the next step what can we expect and and what the yeah the impacts it's gonna have on on other um assets markets and, and markets and risk okay yeah. and risk overall um okay yes i do think it's going to happen it's inevitable there's a lot of uh regimes if you will that uh don't believe in the petrodollar i mean chief amongst those is russia now because of uh, what happened when the uh in the in the ukraine war uh the usa froze the reserves the treasury reserves of uh of uh, russia so the process is this there will be russia will accept yuan it will accept gold i also expect someday that russia will accept bitcoin but they do uh, right and price didn't and they say they will they will but i think they'll price oil in bitcoin and that could be the most substantial move in the bitcoin ma maturity of bitcoin because i think of bitcoin as digital energy anyway and to price your valuable natural resource energy in digital energy makes absolute sense from an engineering perspective okay this is just me as an engineer that uh that says yeah i would definitely price my valuable natural resource energy in digital energy because it's like a closed loop okay it's like a it's a system it's not a leaky system it's a closed system um whether or not that happens quickly i think it's going to happen at some point uh it doesn't matter it's the bigger move is away from the petrodollar and why well because it's a global economy china doesn't want to rely on the petrodollar uh do you know that a lot of refined products you know they're trying to say don't import oil from uh uh, uh russia right. uh, but okay. here's oh yeah but here's the way it goes now russia exports oil to uh various nations in in the, uh, the the east and west and then in those countries like china it gets refined into usable products and then it gets exported from uh, china as not oil but it's refined products so it's either you know kerosene or all these other things uh, gasoline all the things that get that a refinery does with oil and that's fine 
Like, okay, yeah, you stopped the flow of oil, but you didn't stop the flow of refined products because refined products are what makes the uh, the global economy work. So you can't stop the flow of energy. It's what civilization depends upon. Um, you can try hard, but as soon as you try it with monetary breaks, uh, they'll find ways around these uh, these uh, uh, monetary payment rails. And the most interesting thing I see is this, and it's a process that the nation that understands that Bitcoin is actually going to be a savior and Bitcoin will be the store of value that replaces U.S. Treasury debt as the global reserve asset, not global reserve currency, global reserve asset, that's when the game theory really starts to accelerate. And they say, whoa, I have all these US treasuries that I don't even want because the USA is gonna tell me I can't spend it when I wanna spend it. China already has enough. They're like, no, thank you very much. I don't wanna get paid for my uh, exports in US dollars anymore or US treasuries. I want other diversified reserve assets. Well, I think it's Bitcoin, buddy. And it could be gold, but there's problems with gold, the audit, the uh, auditability, the transferability, the uh, portability, you know, all of these things, problem with gold. All right. Bitcoin solves all those things. Don't own zero. I don't care how much you own, but don't make it zero. Even if it's 2% of your portfolio, I think, and this is where we could walk through some math. I think that Bitcoin eventually gets to a valuation of over 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin in today's dollars. Okay. Today's dollars. So Bitcoin trades for under 20,000, which means if I did a probability analysis, the market is telling me that I am 1% chance of being right on my projection because 20,000 divided by 2 million, which is in today's dollars, again, 20,000 today's dollars, 2 million today's dollars, that's one one hundredth. The market's telling me I have a 1% chance of being right, Alexi. I'm like, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm way more certain than 1%. So I'm a buyer of Bitcoin. I don't need to own 100%. Me personally, I probably own about you know, between 15 and 25%, depending on the day and the, the various assets that I have. But at the end of the day, I like the odds that the market is telling me I only have a 1% chance of being right. I don't have to have much more than that. If it goes to my price target, everything else is going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting relationship that you mentioned with uh, energy just in general. In the current setting where energy and yeah, just uh, pretty much anything with us, with, with, yeah, well, you can see it with the energy crisis here in Europe. Right. You can also see it uh, in other parts of the world. It's a commodity that becomes increasingly more rare and also more political. Um, how does that affect then Bitcoin as then a measurement or function of that? If it's more expensive to produce a Bitcoin, how would that work from the economics of the Bitcoin protocol? That's an interesting question. I mean, it depends how you define, is it more expensive to produce Bitcoin because it's being measured in fiat? See, if you measure electricity in Bitcoin and then calculate how much the price of electricity in Bitcoin and then see how much it costs, it's actually a disinflationary, right? Because if Bitcoin goes up in price and the value of electricity is also going up, but at a slower rate than the value of Bitcoin, it becomes deflationary. And that's the beautiful thing. We always are thinking in terms of fiat, and that's where our problem starts. Yes, the cost of electricity in goes up in fiat because fiat goes down. It's like our house. Mm. We haven't really made money on our house. It's just that the unit of account called fiat has gone down in value so that it takes more of those fiat units to buy the same house. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same with electricity. And if you measured electricity in Bitcoin, you may have a much different outcome, I think. And I haven't done the math. And plus, it would project, you know, you'd have to say where you think the price of Bitcoin is going. But I think that is a wild card or a... Uh, call it a variable in the analysis that we wouldn't be able to pin down very easily. So let's just remember when you're measuring things in fiat, 
it gives you a lot different perspective than if you measure it either in gold, you know, the price of stocks in gold, the price of real estate in gold hasn't changed that much, but the price of real estate in fiat money and the price of stocks in fiat money, they have gone way up, not mm -hmm. necessarily because the price of the stocks is worth more. It's just that the unit of account, again, the fiat has debased. Yeah, I like that. And I, I think there's uh, always a lot of comparison between uh, Bitcoin and gold, for example, or Bitcoin yeah. as the reserve currency or now in your case, reserve asset. Asset, um, yeah. So then uh, I've actually, there's this uh, website called Case Bitcoin. I'm not sure if you know it. Uh, it's about no. basically different metrics about how comparing okay. to the 10-year treasury yields and these kind of things and okay. uh, debt and all, all kinds of other metrics. Uh, but so basically um, it would be helpful to also compare the, the the production or the worth of Bitcoin in kilowatts or in um, yeah cubic meter of, of gas or whatnot or uh, barrels of oil. So all true. Um, I don't know the website. Um, <laughs> if it, it, it's a paradigm shift. When you start thinking of the world in Bitcoin, it, it, it takes a long time to get there. Um, and I don't know whether we get there. Like I, I, I actually think the solution is not a Bitcoin world. It's a Bitcoin as a store of value and fiat as your checking account. Okay. So fiat is your checking account. Bitcoin is your savings account. Your checking account is used for international trade where you price different things and you don't have to trade, you know, a horse for two cows or, you know, barter. You use international currencies and those markets will continue to fluctuate and they'll continue to go down all relative but they will all debase just at various rates much like they have and bitcoin will be your store of value it'll be your check uh your your rational your rationality check and it'll say a long time ago much like today when we measure stocks in gold looking back It seemed obvious, but 20 years ago, people weren't measuring stock returns in gold. It takes time for them to understand. And, you know, I know you're a gold guy and I'm not against gold. I told you I own gold. But the funny thing is gold is only $10 trillion. The total global financial assets in the world are $900 trillion. That includes $400 trillion of debt, $300 trillion of real estate, $100 trillion of equities, a hundred trillion of commodities, gold, blah, blah, blah. That's your 900 trillion. That means gold is one ninetieth. Like it's, it's such, it's so insignificant. We don't have to worry about gold. As far as Bitcoin and gold goes, we're together. We understand why we own these things. Don't have a problem with someone who owns gold. That's not your problem. People, your problem is someone who owns debt. Debt is the biggest component of that 900 trillion. That's the low hanging fruit. That is where you need to focus on. So I'm sorry to switch the conversation from, you know, these things back to, to debt, but I'm a debt guy and debt is the problem. And that's why you own Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, in that sense, like when you look at also like the, the, the cycles of credit expansion and uh, contraction, Uh, if I say it right, um, yeah, it's perfect. The, the, um, since 2009, since kind of the birth of Bitcoin, we've only seen in that cycle period, a lot of quantitative easing. Uh, so Correct. a lot of credit was being created during that time. And now we came to a juncture since um, all the central banks made a U-turn to fight inflation to actually start quantitative tightening which Correct. the ECB will aggressively start beginning of next year. Okay. How do you think, how do you think um, and even though the Fed has kind of diminished, right? But it's not fully like comparable to even pre-COVID levels, right? Um, yeah. How do you think that affects uh, Bitcoin? Uh, it's or the price simple. action of they it? They can't continue. Alexei, I've just said that they have to do quantitative easing forever okay. because of the debt spiral. So they can pretend they're not going to do it. And I'm like, fuck you guys. Okay, <laughs> it's this simple. It's math. You cannot not do it. If you want to try, the world will implode. If yeah. you want the world to implode, implode try to do it but yeah. otherwise you have to print money it is grade 11 mathematics so they can huff and they can puff and they can blow your house down but guess what 
They're not going to. OK, because it's mathematics, it's grade 11 math. So they have to do QE, even in this little thing where they're trying to pretend they're doing QT. They've just barely managed to do a little bit of QT and things are going off the rails. Credit Suisse is going to fail. OK, that bank is going to fail. And when that bank fails, it's a systemically important financial institution. And as soon as it fails, they're going to open the spigots like they always do to rescue the financial system. Or if they don't Boom. Well, you better own Bitcoin either way. Okay. Yeah. It's that simple. Okay. So it's inevitable. They will resume quantitative easing. And I think Correct. also the Bank of England kind of already showed this a month or two ago when they had they problems. Uh, you got it, buddy. Yeah. So uh, it's a matter of time until they're going to open the faucets again. Um, and now in terms of adoption of like so on sovereign level. So El Salvador was the first country of uh, adding uh, Bitcoin to their treasury. And then followed suit uh, the Central African Republic as well later on. Yeah. Which ones after that you think are most likely to feel the pain and uh, wanting the orange pill? Well, there's 180 currencies in the world. And we tend to focus on the top 20. I mentioned in that top 20, we have some basket cases already, though. Some like Turkey and uh, Argentina uh, in the top 20 G the largest economies in the world. I don't know who's going to do it, but the smartest person is going to do it first because it then be becomes game theory. Because if you put Bitcoin on your balance sheet and then some other country says, boy, I better do it too. The price of Bitcoin goes up, skyrockets. And if you don't already own some, you're going to be paying more to get in. Um, as far as the next countries that go, it'll probably be the countries that are in that basket of 160 below the 20 at the top. So there's 180 in total. There's 160 at the bottom. I love El Salvador. I went there to visit. I love what they're doing. Um, I'll tell you that uh, the visiting the country, it's, it's uh, you know, it's got vigor. It's, it's you know, it's you, you can feel the country turning around, but it's only six million people. It's really a small country. It's total uh, GDP is $28 billion. Like $28 billion is, you know, barely the size of Miami, right? Like the city of Miami is bigger than the country of El Salvador. So it may not be a country. What if it's a city in the United States mm. that decides to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet? Think about that. Yeah, like Miami. Suarez, I think, is the name of the mayor. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. So. All I'm saying to you, it doesn't have to be a country. It could be a city or a region. I'd love the, the province of Alberta in Canada to start doing it. Why? Because that's where all of Canada's oil is. Well, if they start thinking about putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, why? Because Bitcoin is digital energy. You get the pro. You get the process here. Definitely. Uh, so we just uh, we already mentioned that uh, before, but uh, so your thoughts, of course, on gold. I'm I'm uh, working for a gold company, but I'm I'm initially a crypto guy. But I've seen the, okay. the beauty of of uh, kind of like the same reasons actually on on both communities. I see the yeah. overlapping kind of distrust of the system yes. and wanting it to back it with something that's out of the system. Um, what are your then? And um, uh, what is, because I think in Ontario, Ontario is a big, uh, there's lots of miners over there, right? Uh, gold miners, silver miners. Uh, yeah, so Ontario has a few, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's they're basically junior, junior gold mines. Okay. Um, how do you see then the, the role of gold then um, based to Bitcoin? You think it's going to, over Bitcoin is going to totally overtake? It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. I don't care. Again, yeah. it's only $10 trillion. We have really big problems, okay? We have $900 trillion of problems. Or to be more specific, we have $400 trillion, which is the debt component, in a pie of $900 trillion, And Bitcoin is half a trillion and gold is $10 trillion. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't care. It is not what we need to focus on. We need to focus on this 400 trillion. That's the problem. That's the elephant in the room. Clear. Um, both are going to win. Okay, Alexi, both are going to win. Yeah, I mean, of course, like gold is already on, on central bank's balance sheet and yes. Bitcoin fulfills its digital <laughs> version of it. If you want it or not, uh, at least the close comparison would be definitely gold. Correct. Um, so the mindset is there, but gold is something that everybody also knows. It's something that is historic. It's been there since pretty much ever and people can relate to it. It's a matter of question until people Correct. can also relate to Bitcoin. And 
uh, we are savvy about it. And I think a lot of people who are connected to the internet or digitally active are understanding it uh, quite rapidly and the new generations as well. So maybe it's also a matter of time until upcoming generations who are living in the digital sphere do also see the same uh, utility. Um, but talking about digital things, there's also this other point which I haven't heard you actually talk much about it. It's uh, CBDCs, Central Bank Digital uh -oh. Currencies. And that is something that is really coming a step uh, rapidly, increasingly uh, like pace uh, um, globally. We've seen already China uh, having their first versions of it, implemented them in a few regions and planning to really fully generally implement that in the, in, the, in the years to come. And obviously the same applies to uh, the US, uh, the EU. Everyone, every central bank is really looking deep into central bank digital currencies. And I think Nigeria is pushing really hard, They're even incentivizing yeah. their citizens. And coincidentally, it's also that it's the country with, I think, even the biggest adoption of Bitcoin or at least transaction or transaction volume or, yes, or usage yeah, yeah. Of, of Bitcoin. So... Yes. It, it kind of gives you already a hint of, of, of where are we going. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on CBDCs? We are going there, but they're not a good thing. Uh, CBDCs are digital fiat with surveillance, so they have no store of value. They just allow the government to track your spending, track your position. Uh, they can put expiry dates on your money, meaning you better spend this because we're a consumer-based economy, you better spend this within the next three months or the value of this uh, digital currency evaporates. So go out and spend it on the economy to get the economy rolling. None of that's good. None of it is a store of value. Uh, is it coming? Yeah, the world's moving digitally. It's not. It wouldn't surprise uh, authoritarian governments that want to track their citizens. China makes a ton of sense. Uh, I'm not a fan. I don't want to be digitally surveilled. Uh, so let's, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we have an alternative. That's called Bitcoin, decentralized. So the key thing, central bank digital currencies. We don't like centralization. We like decentralization. That's why Bitcoin. Incidentally, I'm a Bitcoin maxi in the context of a digital ecosystem. I am not a fan of other decentralized, excuse me. I'm not a fan of other altcoin, which are centralized They're like fiat, okay? Fiat, central bank digital currencies or digital fiat is just like a shit coin, mm -hmm. okay? No control on, uh, sc there's no scarcity, no control on supply, can be manipulated by the government, all the same things, central. I'm a decentral, I'm a freedom maximalist. I like to make my own decisions and, uh, and, and live by that, uh, that code. Yeah, I actually wanted to highlight the point of uh, because you're fully maximalist on Bitcoin and you've just said it, the other alternatives, you do not even consider them like Ethereum and such because of their decentralized nature. What is this Correct. difference between crypto and all the other cryptocurrencies that make well, you such a maximalist? Just because of the defined supply, um, you know, you can talk about Ethereum and Vitalik will say, if you asked him what the, the true supply of uh, Ethereum is right now, His answer is, well, it's difficult. Look, I don't want the answer to be what is the true supply. It's difficult. I want to know with certainty what the absolute number of coins outstanding are. I don't want someone to be able to change their mind on that. I don't want someone to be able to say, I'm, we're, we were proof of work. Now we're going to proof of stake. See, that's centralization that makes it worse. Proof of work is the only thing that matters. Proof of stake is fiat. Fiat money is proof of stake. Ethereum is proof of stake. I'm not a fan of proof of stake. Am I telling you not to own Ethereum? No, you can do whatever you want. At the end of the day, Bitcoin is the only thing that solves the fiat Ponzi. And I'm most concerned about the fiat Ponzi more than anything. So that's why I own Bitcoin, full stop. Mm -hmm. And so the future of DeFi, uh, you do not entail Ethereum then into that um, I, I, I'm not smart enough to tell you. Okay, okay. I'm not. Uh, let's not. Let's keep the the argue the the conversation on the fiat Ponzi. And there's lots of altcoin Ponzi's. We've seen them. I'm not saying that Ethereum is part of that Ponzi, but it certainly facilitates that Ponzi. So I'm just a Bitcoin maxi in the context of protecting as a store of value against the fiat Ponzi. I'm a Bitcoin maxi to protect against the fiat Ponzi. Okay.
clear. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I think uh, th we've covered a lot of things, um, and it's uh, it's a nice, uh, I think, overview about. Uh, yeah, it's been awesome. Um, I really appreciate you having me. As a running uh, question, I've seen also you're involved in in other projects that uh, um, contribute to helping kids. Uh, in, oh. in uh, different parts of the regions where they, they need it the most, maybe. Maybe you want to share about those kind of things that uh, you're involved with? Oh, what a nice question. You know what I am? Um, I'm involved in two different platforms. Uh, one is called uh, Looking Glass Education. So Looking Glass Education is a free platform. It's a financial education for the world. But the logical solution is you need to own some Bitcoin. You need to, but it's been uh, translated into uh, over 10 different languages. Uh, we're helping school kids. Um, uh, it, one of the places is in El Salvador. So we've, uh, we've made some donations to El Salvador, to the school system in El Salvador uh, via looking glass education. Uh, it's my goal to help, uh, you know, to try and give back uh, and educate some of the people Um The fiat system's been okay to me, having spent my life uh, trading. Uh, I'm trying to give back, um, and it's it's yeah, it, it gives me great pride. Looking Glass Education is run by two guys. Uh, in particular, one is based in Australia. His name is Daz Bea or B E A uh, one on Twitter at Daz Bea one, and then uh, Seb Bunny. Uh, out of Whistler, British Columbia. He's actually a, a Kiwi, but he lives in Whistler. Uh, and they're doing great work making this site up to, uh, you know, snuff. And it's just, I'm really proud of the work those guys are doing. So mm. uh, happy to be involved, trying to do it for the kids. You know, that's one of my taglines. I like to say it's a uh, uh, hashtag do it for, or for the kids, because that's what Bitcoin is for me. It's for the future. I feel that as a 60 year old and I'm almost 60. Okay. Um, I feel as a 60 year old that we've been part of a generation that's very selfish. We have pulled forward gains for our generation at the expense of our children who are going to have to pay for our foolish financial management. When I say ours, I'm talking about the boomers, okay? The selfish boomers who couldn't pay their own bills, couldn't actually, you know, and and, and that makes me uh, upset. So I want to give back for the kids. Uh, it's about my three children that I feel so strongly about this uh, mission that I'm on. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you bringing it up. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. So don't forget to check that out. And people, I guess, can uh, can contribute or also donate uh, if they want to. Or, that would be amazing. Yeah. I think there's a there's a way to donate to the platform. Absolutely. Uh, we we've got other people contributing by uh, by giving uh, content. You know, by promoting the platform in their in their own countries. And it's really it's become it's it's got a life of its own now. So it's pretty good. Beautiful. No, it's, it's exactly what we need: more kindness and helping each other. Genuine help, education. Um, thank you, Greg. Uh, if uh, you would resume this conversation in one tweet. How would you tweet that out? I love Amsterdam and the people from Amsterdam that are doing the work uh, everywhere around the world. Uh, I meet some great people like yourself who have the same concerns as I do. So my thought is I really enjoyed visiting Amsterdam at the beginning of uh, the fall. Uh, it was about two months ago, I guess. And uh, I'm really happy to meet you in person on your podcast. So thank you for having me. We're going to win we have to win for the kids and with the help of people like you, we will win. Awesome. Awesome. Great concluding remarks. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, my friend.